on this day, the 14th of February, first day of the firebombing of Dresden. This act would be the most controversial, or one of the most controversial, acts by the Allies during this conflict. At least 25,000 people were killed in the few days that this attack took place, and it would be used by the Germans, and later on those sympathetic German cause, as a way to attack and bludgeon the Allies around the head. Even at the time, it was controversial. So let's look at this. The war was going badly for Germany. On the Eastern Front, the Russians had crossed the Oder. They were now 43 miles from Berlin. They were now in actual German territory. In the West, the Allies had liberated all of France, most of Belgium, and about half of the Netherlands. The only parts of Italy that were left under Axis control were in the very north. And the Battle of the Bulge had just ended. It had been a heroic attempt, I suppose you could say, a last ditch attempt to try to force the Western Allies off the continent once again. But it was a pointless exercise because it just wasn't going to happen at this point. Germany was defeated, and what Germany should have done at this point was to surrender. But Hitler would have none of that. He would fight till the bitter end. And he would bring Germany down with him. Now, it seemed to many that the war could end quite quickly. There were some saying that it, there could be a collapse in Germany within a f two or three months. There were others saying that if the Germans held off the Soviet attacks in Silesia and along the Oder, then it could last until the next winter. Imagine that, a six and a half year war. So, there were thoughts about what to do and how to knock Germany out of the war. One of the things that they were thinking was to assist the Soviets on the Eastern Front in their Cilician campaign by attacking somewhere in central Germany. They ended up having a look at what well, first of all was Berlin, they scrapped the idea. They ended up looking at Dresden. Now Dresden did have munition factories, it did have war um, material being produced there, and it was a big communications hub. Railways came together. Dresden. The idea was to attack that and then do enough damage that the Soviets would then be able to put the Germans on the back, back foot and make their advance quicker because everyone at this point wanted the war to be over soon. One of the other points that was made many times that I've read is that the Allies, the Western Allies, couldn't get to Berlin as quickly as they wanted to. They hoped in 1944, Operation Market Garden, they were hoping that they could break through the German lines and then go straight for Berlin and be there by the winter, I suppose Christmas, of 1944. The idea was that the war could end that failed. So the Battle of the Bulge had just taken place, that had failed as well, and so the Allied advance into the Rhineland and up to the Rhine was going ahead, and they would successfully cross the Rhine and then invade the rest of Germany. The problem was, by the time they did all this and fought the remaining uh, German soldiers that were not running off home and taking any uniforms off and pretending that they had nothing to do with it, it would take 
too long to get anywhere near Berlin. It was obvious at this point, with the Soviets being 43 miles away from Berlin, that it would be a Soviet army that would take it. So, they could understand that most of what later became East Germany would be occupied by the Soviets first. And Volmer Command did say, let's show the Soviets what Volmer Command is capable of. So a part of that would be to ruin a city like Berlin, uh, not Berlin, it was already a ruin at this point, like Dresden. Dresden had managed not to be bombed very much. It was an ancient cultural centre. It was the capital of Saxony, and as being the main main court of the Saxon kings, had over the centuries become a beautiful place with beautiful winding streets. I've been to Dresden, and it is a very beautiful city. The part that was bombed is actually the very central part, but if you go across the river, there's an area that was at the time, in 1945, was the new part of the city. But it was built in the 19th century. Still very fine buildings, um, nice streets, cafes, restaurants, that sort of thing. That remained largely undamaged after this bombing. So the new part of the city is actually now the old part, because the, the old part was destroyed and the old part that's being restored is now the new part, although it looks like the old part. I know. So, Dresden was a cultural centre, had great museums because the Saxon kings had loved collecting things. Uh, Dresden uh, ceramics and china had been made there. So it was this great little gem in the middle of Europe. Kind of like, I suppose, uh, a Prague. Uh, there's so many of these beautiful cities in Europe that, well, maybe not at the time, many of them have already been destroyed, but many of them, many of these cities are all over the place. The Second World War was destructive, and it, Warsaw was left to ruin. Minsk, uh, Berlin, obviously, Dresden. Many, many cities were Cologne, another one. Hamburg, many beautiful cities are not that beautiful anymore. There's some areas that weren't completely destroyed, but and there were some areas that were restored. But the problem is, we had terrible architects after 1945. So instead of rebuilding with something that was better, or at least as good, we usually got lumps of concrete. Concrete slabs, concrete boxes, glass boxes, concrete and glass boxes, commie blocks. It was everywhere. And that happens not just in Germany, it happened all around Eastern Europe, it happened in Western Europe as well. Corbusier, what was his plan to demolish the South Bank of Paris and stick up loads of commie blocks and motorways? Insanity. So that was the unfortunate thing. All these cities being destroyed at exactly the time when you couldn't really destroy a city without having maniacs take over afterwards and stick up the worst looking buildings ever built. Anyway, let's get back to 1945. So, the idea was if you impress the Soviets with the power of your bombs and the power of your, your ability to go all that way and flatten the city, then maybe it might make them think, well, let's be sensible, let's keep to our word, let's not go off and do our own thing. This is also related to what was happening in Poland in terms of the Soviet occupation of Poland and the idea that the Soviets would be in charge of Eastern Europe as well. So it's kind of meant for them as well. So, that is the lead up to the bombing itself. A raid 
was supposed to happen um, on the 13th during the day. And it was supposed to be the United States Air Force that was going to begin the bombing, followed by the RAF during the night. The American Air Force uh, decided not to do it because the weather wasn't very good. And so it was the RAF that started this. Now, they had over about, well, the RAF had about 700 aircraft involved in this. So, and th um, 360 heavy bombers, so the Lancasters and the Halifaxes, and they started the bombing. And that would be followed, three hours later, by another wave of bombing, specifically to get the people who were then trying to put out the fires, so the rescuers and the firemen and that sort of thing. Which sounds kind of despicable, to be honest. They bombing the people that coming to rescue the people that are under the rubble and putting out fires in the city. So that's how it was done back then. They called them terror bombs, terror bombings. This raid went over a couple of days, a couple of nights. So it was a pretty awful thing. So I went to the 13th, 13th and the 14th that night, 14th and the 15th, and as late as the 16th, they were targeting people on the ground. Various planes were attacking the refugees pouring out of the city, and there were many hundreds of thousands, I imagine, at least tens of thousands. During the bombing, the central part of the city, the part without the factories, without the railway yards, without the big warehouses or the barracks for the army guys and soldiers or piles of weapons and munitions, they destroyed that part. It was said afterwards, and there was a lot of criticism, even at the time, that they should have been attacking the areas in the suburbs where the factories were where the armaments were, where the railways were. Now, they did attack the railways in Dresden, but they seemed to take a lot of time bombing the actual cultural heart of the city, rather than attacking the bits that they said that they should be, because that's the whole excuse of bombing Dresden. But there was also another point, and it was terror to instill terror into the populace. At this point, 1945, it had been more than, well, about six years, I suppose, almost, that terror bombing had been used against civilians. It first been used in Poland, when the Germans had used terror bombing against Warsaw and other smaller places. And terror bombing was used against Rotterdam. In 1940, it was used a few places in France during the invasion, and then it was used in Britain by the Germans, on London, and Coventry, Birmingham, Liverpool, Belfast, Glasgow, Portsmouth, etc. And this is now 1945, so that is five years after the terror bombings began in Britain, it's almost six years after they began in Poland. Terror bombing came, must have been obvious at this point. It didn't really work. It caused terror at the time, but it didn't really make people think, oh, let's just give up and surrender. It seemed to make people more determined that the other side won't win. Obviously, in Warsaw, they had to surrender because they were surrounded. And the same in Rotterdam, they were being invaded. But Aerial bombardment doesn't by itself do very much except make, make people hate you. The Germans couldn't invade Britain, so the bombing was in many ways pointless and useless. And the bombings that were useful, attacking the radar stations and the RAF fields, they took planes away from that to attack the civilian centres instead. Now. 
this terror bombing, it's it was going to be useless as well. It was not going to make Germany surrender any sooner. The thing that made Germany surrender was Allied armies taking cities and towns and villages and strategic points and controlling autobahns and railways. That's how you conquer a country, not by terror bombing. And this was even a criticism that was made just after the bombing in Dresden had ended. People in Britain, and even in the United States, were quite critical of this bombing, because for many it seemed pointless. It seemed only to be about killing civilians, and this was not something the Allies were supposed to be about. On the first night, RAF set off at just after 5 in the evening for their 700 mile journey. So there's a group of Lancasters, and they went and there were some planes ahead of them that dropped some uh, flares, or was it magnesium parachute flares, to light up the area so that the bombers know where to drop their loads. Now, there was something like 181 tons of bombs, um, about 60% were high explosive and about 40% were incendiaries. That was the first night and the, the center was ruined and the next three hours later the next lot of planes were flying over. From 500 miles away they could see the glow of the fires from Dresden. They didn't really need more incendiaries but they dropped more incendiaries towards the Grosser Garden, that's the that's a picture on this video, of that garden before, it was an old royal garden with the museum in there. Um, they dropped it there and around the Hauptbahnhof, the main railway station, and so they were spreading outwards from the areas where the fires first started. That was the first night. On the morning of the 14th, the United States Air Force, they were scheduled to bomb Dresden around midday. And there was other towns that they were supposed to be bombing as well. There was Chemnitz and Magdeburg. And there was... Um, where was it? Another place. Os... Os... No, that's in... In itself. Uh, Mitzburg? Missburg? I think it is. Oh, and Bolin. Bolin, which is about 60 miles away from Dresden, has a large synthetic oil plant, which was something that they actually needed to bomb because that was dangerous for the Germans to have. The American Air Force the next day dropped almost 800 tons of bombs and incendiaries on Dresden once again. wonder how much a place needs to be bombed. It seems like it was a, a free-for-all at the time, because the Americans were told if they couldn't uh, find um, the Chemnitz, then they would go to Dresden. So they were also bombing other places, as well as Leipzig, which is quite nearby as the B-17 B, uh, fortress, uh, flying fortress bomber goes. So it was a pounding after pounding after pounding. Like two nights and two days, and the place burned for days afterwards. Apparently, Frauenkirche, the main church in the center of the very beautiful one that has been rebuilt, that wasn't actually hit by bombs, but it, it did become so hot during the firestorm that it started glowing red. The stone of this building started glowing red. 
and it was still standing once the raid had ended. And bit by bit it would cool down, and as it cooled it started to crumble and then it collapsed because of that. So it wasn't actually hit by a bomb, it was just superheated by what was a, a hurricane of fire that whipped through the center of the city and anyone in the center of the city would have been incinerated. Um, perhaps even bones would have been burnt at that point and that sort of heat. If the stones of the cathedral, I don't know if it's officially a cathedral, it's a Protestant one, but if the stones of the Frauenkirche were glowing red, then imagine what that would do to a human body. And all the buildings around it would have been gone. Many of the buildings were timber framed, some plaster, uh, timber shingles on the top, it would have had no chance. It would have been completely destroyed. There has been some estimates or arguments over how many people died. Uh, there was the very famous book about Dresden, um, written by the notorious David Irvin, and he put it somewhere in hundreds of thousands. There have been people saying it could have been a half a million, because of all the ref refugees coming in from the east, from Silesia and Pomerania and Prussia, getting away from the Soviets. It probably wasn't half a million. The official one is about 25,000. Um, and then there's some saying it could be as high as maybe 70,000. But everyone seems to have settled on the 25,000, even the mayors, various mayors of Dresden have said that. So we'll take that as it is. But there was a lot of people, 25,000 people. There was about 60,000 people who died in the Blitz in Britain over a period of, well, a year from September 1940 up until, I suppose, when they started attacking the Soviet Union. And then there was a few months in 44, the V1s and the V2s were being fired towards London. So probably about 12 months and there would have been the odd bombing here and there. But over that period, 60,000 died. In two nights, two days, 25,000 people died in Dresden alone. That is an enormous number of people. And very few of them would have been involved in the military struggle against the Soviet Union or the Western Allies. Once the news of Dresden's destruction became widely known, it obviously was used by the Germans as propaganda. They said 202,000 people had been killed. But despite the propaganda, it was obvious that something had happened here. There were questions asked in Parliament of Churchill and his government. Churchill himself referred to the Dresden bombing as a terror bombing, a terrorist act. And he did so whilst questioning the usefulness of things like this. There was a lot of complaint, you could say, amongst certain intellectuals, at church leaders, and, as I said, people even in Parliament. In the United States, there was probably a little bit less concern, but there were people within Roosevelt's administration who didn't like how they'd gone about this, and it did come across very badly even at that time. It's one of the reasons why Dresden is still political and politicized. Not many people, even the German far right, talk very much about the Battle of Berlin the Battle of the Bulge, or Normandy, or anything like that, but Dresden, they bring up, because for them, they can make it about 
innocence being destroyed by these wanton killers, the Allies. And they're not entirely wrong, because as I said, even Allies on the Allied side, there was a lot of complaint, a lot of protest, a lot of people feeling very uneasy. A Germany that was prostate, that was falling, that's only had a matter of months left, at best. And Dresden was not a place that needed to be destroyed in this way. Getting away from that, one of the good things, I made a complaint earlier on about the after-war um, rebuilding and the architects of the 50s, 60s, 70s, up until today, how they did as much damage as the war itself. Well, the great thing is, in Dresden, the old quarter, including the Frauenkirche, has been rebuilt. And it is very impressive to see. Now, it is obviously a copy, but despite that, it is stunningly beautiful. Went into the Frauenkirche, and there was a service on. It was great to see that it was, had been rebuilt. It was At one point, it was a car park during the East German times, and now it was back as the Frauenkirche. The statue outside is the statue of Martin Luther, the guy who started the Reformation, and he started it in Saxony. A Saxon, I think he was the Saxon elector at the time, he was the king, was one of the big supporters of Protestantism and Luther himself. The winding streets that go, that radiate out from the square in front of the Frauenkirche has been rebuilt. There's still a lot of work to do. There's certain areas of the city that are very, still very Soviet looking. But it's clean, it's tidy, it's taken care of, so it's not the most offensive architecture, I suppose you could, you could say. It's not as bad as it could be. And bit by bit, it's being replaced with buildings that are more in attune to the original Dresden. So it is good to see that not all is lost, that you can, if you make the effort, spend a little time and money, and get the right craftsmen in, you can rebuild what was once there. So that is the story of Dresden. If you like these videos, come back tomorrow for more. Like, subscribe, and comment.